Right, we are continuing here in the Pardes Remainem. We're still in the first chapter of the first Shad. And as we've seen, the Ramak is going on to interpret the first Mishnah, actually the third Mishnah, but the first Mishnah in Sefi Yetzirah that discusses the ten Sefiras. The first two Mishnahs were just general things or general uh, overviews of what it said, Vishlesh and Vishtayim Nesivas, and then what those 32 Nesivas are, and then the third Mishnah, and throughout the whole first Perak of Safi Yetzirah, is going on to elaborate and to tell us what these ten Sefiris are and different facts and points about them. And Ramak sees this Mishnah and this chapter as the source, the earliest source, or the most important source for the existence of ten Sefiris. And since his way of doing everything is working through the sources that he takes as authoritative, so he's working through this Mishnah. Now, Dramak, as is one to do, is sort of getting slowly very much stuck. He's driving into the Mishnah and getting stuck on very Talmudic and detailed interpretations and different interpretations that are possible uh, for this Mishnah. So we're going to sort of divide it into, um, let's say, two or three different points. And then at the third point, he's going to go on a huge detour and the next uh, three chapters, the Rekbez, Gimel, and Dalit, are just him sort of arguing with different Mepharshim and what the meaning of this one line in this Mishnah, Chamesh Kineget Chamesh, means. And uh, honestly, if, if he would have edited a book to be a little bit more beginner-friendly or to be organized in a more um, logical fashion, it would, this would not be here. And Ramak actually himself, um, in his uh, Ornerav, where he does a short summary of what you need to know from based on Pardes Ramonim, totally skips almost this whole shot because over there he's just giving you the summary of the system and all of these details are not really important uh, for understanding the basics of the system. But since, as we said, we do want to do this in a very, in the way that he did it and the reason for this is, this is definitely his way of learning and this is his way of showing his work. So later when he just tells you stuff, you'll learn that you're supposed to ask him where do you get this from and who, who said that it's like this and so on or at least where does it say right even if we don't ask uh, like he says generally even if we're not asking why things should be this way in general or sometimes we do he's going to ask where it says and what's the source of it and is that are you sure that that's the meaning of the source and so on so this is where he's going to get sort of bogged down for three chapters in bringing grais and sources and proof text to prove his his parish and this Mishnah and so on. So that's that's the third part. Let's go back to where we were. But the Ramak does, now the Ramak, we have to look a little bit in the other Mepharshma of the Sefi Yetzirah, which he quotes here and see how he's, what he's taking from them, what he's arguing with them and so on. But in the most basic uh, level, Ramak claimed, and that's what he started off, right? And he started off, what he said here, that this Perik, it says Perik Hazeh, but in, in, even maybe only in this Mishnah, the Bala Sefer, Sefer Yitzir, whoever it was, as we've discussed, wants to not only uh, give us the existence, the fact of the Ten Sefiris, but also sort of to prove it, or at least to, I don't know what kind of proof this is, maybe it's a proof in the sense of proof text, but it also to show where he got it from, right? And therefore he started with this Mishnah, which says, and we have the Mishnah here, right? There's uh, sort of four parts in the Mishnah, right? Es Sefiris Belima, and Es Sefiris Belima is also a language that he keeps on repeating every time he says, Esos and this is one of the things that all the Mepharshim want to understand. Ramak shortly said that Belima means without essence, Belima hot. In other words, we do not grasp the essence of the Sefiris. And then it says, Mispar Eser Etzbaz, the amount and the number of ten fingers. And Ramak claimed that this is not just corresponding Sefiris to fingers, as actually some Mepharshim have understood, that this is just talking about this correspondence, since everything has a correspondence as one of the basic uh, ideas of Kabbalah is that there's a correspondence between the body and, and the world and so on. This is, according to the Ramak, not what's mainly going on in this Mishnah. It might be something in the background, but what's mainly going on is the Mishnah trying to prove, so to speak, the existence of ten spirits from that spurs, and he quotes the Pusik, since the Pusik describes, right, and we've discussed this at length, since the Pusik describes God creating the world with his hands and sometimes even with his fingers, and since fingers are ten, at least on humans, humans have ten fingers, so we assume that there are ten things, which are known as the ten spheres, which with which, or by which, or through which, God created the world. Okay. Then it says two more parts. Chomesh, Kneget, Chomesh. 
So the five against five. So this is of course working according to the according to the two hands. You have ten fingers. They are divided into two. There's five on one hand, five on the other hand. And then the Sefer Tzira says Ubris Yachid Mechuvenes Beemza Bemilas Lashon Milas Moi. So and and precisely in the middle Mechuven Mechuvan Beemza, right? Precisely in in between these two hands, we have some thing called Bris Yachid. We don't yet know what that means. And that presyachet seems to have two aspects or two parts, as it says, the milas loshain of a milas moir. Now, we don't know what these things are either, but in any case, we already know the first half of the Mishnah. And now, the Ramak, the first thing we're going to do here with the Chumash, Kenegit Chumash, is continuing to explain it in the light of what he said, that this Mishnah is trying to show you from the idea of God creating the world with his fingers the fact, the existence of ten spheres. So that's his first point. Point of this chamesh kneged chamesh of this yochid mechvenes beemza, and then he will try to give us the analogy or the answer of what actually this five against five means in the world of spheres, and that's where he's going to get uh, very stuck. So again, number one is proved the existence of ten spheres from the idea of of the fingers. So this is according to the Ramak, this is all right here the entire source for the sefer tzira. Of course, later he's going to give us more explanations of why these things need to exist and so on, but he's here working just with the sefer tzira. Number two, there's some detail of this that need to be proven from the ten spheres and from them being five and five. And number three, we need to know what these five and five exactly, which five spheres are the first right five, which five spheres are the left five, and you can have three pshatim in that, and that's going to take us for another who knows how long to even just read through because it's very complicated. So let's let's go back to what we said first. So first, this pshat is chumash k'neged chumash, and I think we read this last time already. And he said, there's a question here, and this is the Ramak's way of reading everything. And this is based on the what's Rabbi Tzchak Nachneton's way of reading everything. And they always understand that a text doesn't say things just to say them. There's always a, a hidden question or a hidden assumption or a hidden question which it's trying to answer. In other words, I already told you this hand spirit, so why am I saying that it's Chumash? Can I get Chumash? Uh, yes, of course, that hand is two hands. There's the right hand, the left hand. What information are you adding here? Right? So he always has this kind of question where every word or every clause in a sentence, every part of a text, has to be saying something new. And the way of he articulates it usually, and although this might be a little uh, confusing way of articulating it, but it's still, uh, if we would take out this part of making everything into a question and an answer, it might seem to actually make sense without more sense, without doing that. The way he articulates it is he says, there's a question, and this is answering that question. So what's the question that he asks? And of course, all these things don't exist in the text, so you could always ask, like, you're just putting things in that don't exist. But if we sort of, so I, this is a, I think this is just his way of articulating it, but we could still think that Chamesh Kenegit Chamesh is trying to add some information. It's trying to simply uh, explain more about how the structure, how these spheres work. And then that will answer the question that Ramak claims the Sefer has in mind, or maybe that will may more precisely explain what he's meaning to say. Right, And his question was that Sometimes it seems to say, the Pesach seems to say, and there are some different Pesukim that seem to say that there is God created the world with one hand only. And the Ravid the actually, which is, seems to be the source for this whole, uh, where he quotes the Mepharshim. It's not the Ravid, but whoever, the Perish that's known as the Ravid, brings more Pesukim, which seem to say that God created the world with one hand. Right. So there seems to be a question, the way that Ramak asked the question, is that it seems like there's a heaven with one hand and the earth with another hand, so there's so then there's five spheres, not ten. So that's, according to the Ramak, Chomesh Kenegit Chomesh is answering the question, who said there are ten spheres? Well, maybe we should say there's one, God calling, there's only one five spheres. In other words, that there is, the world was created with one hand. That's since the hand is the analogy from which we learn the spheres here. So in other words, why would we need two hands? And there's even Psukim that seems to say this, that one hand is enough. So why would we need two hands? And according to him, the Sefi Yitzhid is answering this by saying, Chumash, Kneget Chumash, and his answer sadly is pretty weak uh, as far as I can tell. I, I don't really understand what he is, how his proof is. He says since one is against the other, so the, we should count both together. I'm not sure what it exactly means, this, what this, this paragraph. I don't entirely understand what it's saying, or if the question is that one hand is enough, and there's even Psukim that say one hand is enough. And he, well, he only quotes the Psukim, I think I've quoted it here, right? For example, the Ravid in the bottom shows you, it says, So it seems to have been created only with one hand, or with Tefach, and the Shemaim Bezeres Tikkun, I'm not sure that, or it says, So sometimes, and he has actually a different answer to the question, so the Ravid doesn't seem to 
read his problem with these other psukim into this Efi Yitzira. He says, well, so maybe there's some Shemaim that was created with this hand and another Shemaim that was created with another hand. These are talking about different levels. One of the things that Amak continuously does is reads in later uh, problems into the original source itself. So if the original source probably, the, Ra- the Ravid doesn't, doesn't say this, right? The Ravid doesn't say that Chumash Kneget Chumash is the Shefi Yitzira answering to the challenge from According to him, the Shef Yitzira says simply that there's ten spirits just like there's ten fingers. So, and based on these images from the Psukim of God creating the world with his hands or his fingers. Then he himself goes on to ask, okay, but what are we going to do with the question of what are we going to do with these questions? And he has an answer for that. The Ramax, and this is something very inherent to the Ramax method, always is going to claim that, or it's something to think that he often does, is claim that the original Mishnah was thinking of this, and that's actually why he has another word, which says, although we already know that there's ten fingers, you could look at yourself at your hands and see that there's five and five. And according to him, it's coming to answer this challenge, which, according to which there maybe you only need one five. And this, his, but his answer, I do not understand how Chumash Kinegit Chumash answers this. We might understand and take him to be mean saying something like, since five hands, the five fingers of one hand are always working together with the five fingers of the other hand, or generally, so maybe we sh- were meant to count them together. I do not entirely know uh, how we would, how he understands it. And then he does understand, but really what he says in, in his language, in his formulation is like this. Since Shamaim was made with one hand and the Uretz with another hand, so that's ten together. And since we sh- there's no reason to actually separate Shemaim and Uretz, because both were created by God. So we have to see this as both. And it's true. The separation is still true. And as he's going to go on and, and show us in different ways, it's true that the right hand, so to speak, created the heaven, and the left hand, so to speak, created the earth. But the ten spheres are actually both together. So don't separate the ten spheres and say, what? well, the, sh- the Shemaim was created with one, and therefore it's an art law, because you have to count the Uretz also. And there's no real reason to separate and say there's five and the same five. And maybe that seems to be what he's saying. It's not entirely uh, simple. And now, the Ramak goes on to explain the fourth clause of the Mishnah. And to him, again, this is continuing the same question. We're continuing the same question. What is the proof from this image of ten fingers that there are ten and not five? And now he adds something that maybe there are twenty. Why? And it says like this, because if you're go- working with fingers, then why don't you do to say that there's 20 fingers? Because every person, a human being, has 10 fingers on his hand and 10 fingers on his feet. So then why won't you say there's 20? And now he goes on, he goes on and he makes it very complicated. And he says, well, I have an answer for you. You can say that the 10 fingers on your feet are not another 10 spheres. And this is really his answer, because dramak to dramak, this is a serious question. And it's actually a serious question for the Sefi Yitzira also, apparently, and we have to think about this. But l- let me just say why, um, no, let, me, let me finish what he's saying. Cause, because the, uh, if we're working with this, with this image of a person, and saying God created the world with his fingers and so on, so then there's either 20. Now the Ramak says, I have an answer for this. And according to him, the answer is like this. And we're not sure why we need this answer at all. Like we should say simply that if, if we take 10 to be the primary number, then yes, that's why there are 10 fingers on your hand, and that's why there are 10 fingers on your feet. That's the same reason. But the 10, we're not talking about the fingers, literal fingers, we're talking about the abstract fingers, right? The Sefi uh, is at least using this as an analogy or using this as a source, but the fact that there are 10 fingers on your feet don't mean you should count more. Of course, we might ask the question, why do we count? But of course, that's not a real question. I mean, I'm not sure, and nobody would, I mean, and I can give the simple answer for what I think, why I think this is not a question. Because we, we just said that we got the image of, of fingers and hands from this uh, different psukim, which talk about God creating the world with his hands. There are no psukim talking about God creating the world with his feet, or with his fingers on his feet. So why would we even begin to think to count those? I don't know why he must not be thinking in this way. And we have I don't know what his way of thinking actually is. Um, there's a certain, like, taking literally the the world created by God, and then the numbers of fingers, since feet have also fingers, I don't know uh, what is actually going on here in that, to answer that question. I don't have an answer to that question. It doesn't seem to be a real reason to me. But maybe what he's saying is only just another uh, elaboration of this. And again, you have to keep in mind that he's working very much backwards, because he already has in his mind an answer to this question. And his answer to this question, in other words, he really thinks that the fact, and the Sefer Yitzhira itself 
of course, talks about the fingers on the feet too, so we have to understand what the Sefet Tzira itself means by that. We can't just ignore it, of course. But the Ramak already has an answer in mind to this question. In other words, let's ask the question by itself. Again, let's do just like what we did in the five against five. What's the actual answer to the five and five? So the Ramak has one answer. The Ramak's answer. Who the Ramak the answer is? That five, the five of heaven and the five of earth are meant to be counted together. They're one creation. Five, it's true, five are, five are heavenly and five are earthly or so on, but they're still one. Now, what is his actual answer to this one? You will ask him, okay, you told me that we should have ten spheres because there are ten fingers and two hands. Why don't we count 20 fingers from two hands and two feet? And his answer is like this. His answer is that that actually does show us something about the spheres. And that shows us something which he calls, and he says, again, commission of is going and working backwards. In other words, he assume, he's telling you something that he's going to say in, the, in 15 Shodim from here, from here, which is something known, which, which is he, something he calls the four worlds, right? And the four worlds is a, an idea or a doctrine that we find in, in the Zohar, at least in, 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 in mainly in Tikkun Zohar and Re'a Mehemna, that those parts of the Zohar, and the Zohar has the idea of there being olam four olamas, known as Atzilas Ria Yitzira Asiya. Mainly, sometimes mainly talking about olam Atzilas versus versus olam Abriya, which is known, which is known as the olam Akisa, the throne. So the throne for the ten spheres are the olam Abriya, and according to the Ramak, that is those ten spheres and their second ten spheres, and those ten spheres are the ones which the feet are referring to. This is very interesting in a certain sense because this body image that he has here is sort of split between the two worlds. So the hands would be referring to Olam Atzilas, and the feet would be referring to Olam Abriya. And that sort of corresponds with the idea of Olam Abriya being the kiset, so the chair, so if, if the Atzilas is sitting on a chair, so his feet are sort of on the level of the chair. That's, that's his, his image that he has here. And now what he what he's saying is that and he had a big question and Ramak in, in Sharabia, in that Shad was very worried by the very problem because he was very worried by the idea of there being four worlds. Because to him that contradicts what's the basic principle of Kabbalah, with like the name of this Shad, which is Esevloi Tesha Esevla If it's so important that we have ten spheres, not nine and not eleven, how did we suddenly enlarge them to be forty spheres? If there's four worlds and each one has ten spheres, then there must be uh, 40 spheres and not uh, and not 10. How can that be? Right? And as he says, his answer over there was that it's not really true. When we talk about four worlds, that doesn't multiply the amount of spheres into uh, 40. There's really only 10 spheres. And the second 10 are really only a mirror or a, uh, he calls it here, a shadow or a cloth, a cell or a levush of the first 10 spheres. And even over there, he says even more precisely, there are not really any ten spheres of Ulam Abriya. But there really are only one ten spheres. And Ulam Abriya is a world by itself. It's not that ten spheres are not the Ulam Abriya. In the Ulam Abriya, there is the influence or the shefa or the light of these ten spheres, which the Ulam Abriya sort of becomes a levush for or a shadow of. And that light, since it's a lesser level of light, in the Ulam Abriya, you sort of get the light of the spheres in themselves. For the Ulam Abriya, you only get a shadow of those lights. Well, a shadow of a light is a little weird because shadow is the opposite of light. Anyways, a second level of that light. And that is uh, what Ulam Abriya is. So in other words, we, and this is all to answer his problem that we didn't multiply the spheres more than 10. There's 10 spheres. Only those 10 spheres have a lot of different, we call them interpretations, or a lot of different uh, instantiations, a lot of different places or ways of seeing them. And Ulam Abriya, they're seen in some way. And that's what we mean when we say there's 10 spheres of Ulam Abriya. We don't literally mean that there's more than 10 spheres ever. We only mean that there's 10 spheres. And those 10 spheres themselves are, can be seen from the window, or like the same from one window or from another window and so on. Okay, So that, that's his basic answer over there. And of course, there's a lot of more elaboration of, after we get to that to understand exactly what it means. And now, just getting back to this. And now this concept, this big, this idea is his answer to the question of what the feet fingers are doing, and the feet fingers are talking about are remes too, the spheres of Ilma Abriya, which are a shadow or a an, um, a mirror image or an image of the spheres of Ilm Hatzilas, and they're the same ten. In other words, they're the same ten. That's really what he's trying to get at. They are the same ten. That there's not twenty spheres because there's only ten spheres seen in different lights or seen on different levels, but they are the same ten spheres. So therefore, that's the answer. If you ask him the Ramak the question. What do you mean there's 10 spheres, there's 20 fingers? Well, the answer is no, there's only 10 spheres. But those same 10 are seen in your hand and are seen in your legs, just in another uh, version of them, in another image of the same 
things, right? Now the Ramak says, but there's a problem with this because there's no reason why I should do this for the fingers of the feet and not for the fingers of the hand, uh, for the difference between the fingers of the feet and the fingers of the hand, and not for the difference between the right hand and the left hand, right? Because if we, and then it would actually even make sense in some sense, because we just told you that the Shmaim is from the right hand and the Urat is from the left hand, and those two things seem to have a similar correspondence to El Matzilis and El Mabriya and so on. So why do you tell me? So his question really, and it's a very good question if you think about it, forget about the text of the Sefer Yitzhak question, once we have this idea of that sometimes we say this is one thing in a different, in a different image, sometimes we say, no, it is two things in some sense, who decides when is, when, which, is, which is which? What is, the, what is the reason to make a difference between this and that? Why don't you tell me, no, there's ten spheres, the five fingers on one hand are not are different, and don't tell me there's only five, and the second five is just a copy or a carbon copy of that, no. They're both, they're both five fingers. Um, but do tell me that when they're talking about the next 20, right? That's his, that's his question, right? So once we have this idea of one, ten, one set of 10 being the same set in a different image, why can't we do that on five? And then, so either there's, so the way he says is either there's five spheres or there's 20. It doesn't seem to be a good reason why there should be specifically 10, okay? That's his question. Now, again, if you would ask me this question, I would sort of think that it's not a good question. Of course, the question is very good. It's so what we always think. He doesn't let them. This is something that bothers many people. And many often when we get in Kabbalah, they seem to see a lot of arbitrary things. In other words, if you want to say everything is arbitrary, just this is what it is. Okay, but they are trying to give logics and reasonings for things, right? If you give me a reasoning, there's a very important reasoning. It seems to be true. A very, it's a very insightful idea that we could have. We could look at the same thing through different mirrors or through different windows or through different uh, tinted glass windows. And we'll see different things, but they're still only the same one. That seems to be a very important idea. And then that answers the question of how come there is more than 10 spirits, there are only 10. But actually, once you have this idea, then I would have to ask you, why did you decide to count 10 spirits? And the way he, he asked the question is, why did you decide to count 10 and not 5? But honestly, we could ask the same question, why there's more than one spirit? And of course, that's something that he himself says. And in, in Shar Gimel and other places, he would talk about the 10 spirits itself as being a cell one to the other or just being 10 different windows or 10 different uh, vessels for the same light, and there's only one light, so there's only one God, that, which is in the 10 spheres. And then we really have to ask, what's the point of there being those 10 precisely, and why at that level? And I actually don't know the answer to this question, because I just made the question much bigger, for, much worse, uh, much harder for him, because he's just asking, why is there 5 and 5? And based on this image of the fingers and the, and the hands, which, okay, I'd have a different, I would have a different answer to that question. But if you ask the significant question, if you ask the question on the actual content, if we have this idea, which seems to be a very powerful idea, the idea of the one thing being able to be interpreted in many different ways, which seems to be a very important thing, and this is really important, this is really why it's important for him, the whole idea of Esavli Esav relative to the t second world, because he wants to show you that there's, there's, are not, there's not a multiplicity here, there's only there's oneness here, and there's only one set of ten spheres and not two. Then really the question has to be asked by the ten spheres themselves, why we insist on calling them ten. And of course he himself would insist on saying that they are ten and one in many different senses. And then we have to ask, and therefore why do you insist on saying the word ten? What do you gain out of cutting off the number at ten? And there's an answer, there isn't really an an there is really an answer to this question, although I don't know the answer for the precise number of ten. There's, there's a qualitative difference between uh, when we say and it's this and we say that, well, we'll have to get in much later places to answer. I'm just saying that the actual question seems to be a very serious question. The question that he asks, which is the question of the this symbolism of the fingers and the hands, in my humble opinion, seems to be a weak question. In other words, we're going to see he has an answer to this, which, again, we have to think of. But this, I would say the answer is simple, right? Just like I said before. The whole idea where we got ten spheres was from the image of God creating the world with his hand. There is no image of God creating the world with his feet. There's a good reason for that. Because hands are actually uh, tools of, of action, of creation, right? And even if someone would tell you this is all just a, a muscle, it's all just imagery, doesn't was never meant to be counting fingers, okay? That, that's probably the pshat. But do it makes sense why he would say fingers and why he would say hands, right? Because it's just... It's working with the analogy of humans, which create things with their hands. People don't create things with their feet. If we talk about feet, we're talking about walking or going. People might walk with their things. There's actually language of God's feet, right? From the raglo, tachas raglo, and so on. But those are not images of creation. Those are images of other things, whatever they are. Whatever the nimshal of them is, they're not about creation. If we're talking about creation, then it totally makes sense to count hands 
And maybe you, I would understand some of that tells me to count only the right hand, and I discussed this in the last class, but it definitely makes sense to speak of the right hand and the left hand as both uh, being part of this. And it seems important that people generally, it's, it's useful to have two hands, so it makes sense to describe the fullness of creation by two hands. It doesn't make sense to add the feet into this. So this is not really a question. If the question is on the image, it's not really a question. I don't really see that it needs an answer. Maybe this is sort of could work with what he says in his, in his answer. And back to the Ramak. The Ramak himself claims, as he's like, we just said, this is what a thing that he likes to do, that the Mishnah itself was worried by this question. And therefore, so he proved, he answered this question of why do we have specifically 10 and not 5 or 20, once we have the idea of one being a shadow of the other, doesn't have an answer for this. And the answer is, How is that an answer? And we'll have to get to understand later what exactly bris yochid means and, and so on. But in general, and of course this is sort of working backwards in that thing, in general bris yochid means that there is something connecting the right hand and the left hand, which is actually the bris yochid. What that exactly means, according to the Ramak, it literally means the torso or the body. That's going to be in his explanation later. So obviously, just like anyone can see, there is something connecting the right hand and the left hand, which is whatever whatever is in where your heart is or where your, where your body is, where your torso is which is called Teferis, that's connecting and, and we could say coordinating or making cooperate the right hand and the left hand. So there's something, and of course maybe this has an inner sense in the brain and so on, but there's something in, in between which coordinates the right hand and the left hand, which is what's called Bris Yochid Muchavenes Ve'emsa. And therefore, since we find there's something, a Yochid and a Bris, Bris according to him is just a way of saying something that Creates a right, creates a bond, creates a, some connection between the two. There's something connect, creating a connection, creating a coordination, creating cooperation between the right hand and the left hand. So in that sense, they become into a set of of uh, ten, and we do not find. But the, and so that answers the difference between the right hand and the left hand versus the hands and your feet. There is nothing connecting your hands and your feet in the same sense as connecting your uh, right hand, the left hand, right? At least doesn't. <laughs> and therefore, there is something connecting your two feet, right? Just like there's something, maybe the lower part of your body or something like that is to, we could see as connecting their two feet and coordinating them, just like we have the bris, the upper bris. So there's two bris, like the Sefi Tzir himself says, bris loshen or bris moir. Okay, so bris loshen, according to the Ramak, is whatever is going to be connecting the right hand and left hand. We're going to see simply, obviously, the literal translation of this, which most uh, understand, this lishan is your tongue or your mouth. The mouth is in some sense seen as between the two, between the two hands, and bris mar is 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 the bris, which is between the two feet. Mar being a language of uh, erva or something like that. Now, and Ramak agrees with the second interpretation, but now with the first, he doesn't think that bris lishan means the mouth. And why? Because he needs us to. It's actually sort of weird to think of the mouth as coordinating between the right and the left hand. And that that would need an explanation. Why why would that be true? And maybe the Soviet is just looking at things symbolically and not in such a literal sense. But he is looking at it in a literal sense. And especially because he needs this to be a proof, right? If we're just giving the Soviet to give us ideas, okay, but Ramak is reading into the Soviet Sira the proof for the Soviet Sira's ideas. And sp even more specifically he's reading in the question of why do we take the right and left hand as one set, and then we don't take the right the hands and feet as one set, but we say that they are an image of each other. So the answer is that there is something between the right and left hand. There's also something between the right and the left foot, right? But there is nothing between the hands and feet. Now, unfortunately, I don't know why this would be true either, because obviously there is something between the hands and feet, and we can obviously talk about some sort of coordination between your hands and your feet in any, in any sense that we talk about, and it's actually even true. Not only is that true, for the muscle, for, for the for the existence in the person's body, it's even true for the spheres. And of course, again, it's hard to see what the quantitative qualitative difference here is. Um, obviously, the Ramak agrees that in a certain sense, the right hand and the left hand are a shadow of each other, as he just said. And whether they're right and left, whether they're top and bottom, as we'll see later, they are still in some sense have the same kind of relation. <laughs> and even he also agrees that the Ulama Bria and the Ulama Tzilis have a relation. There's something connecting them, obviously. Otherwise, they would not be connected. And this idea of something connecting them is very basic for Kabbalah. And I think for Dramak also, we'll have to look if he has literally this idea. But there's obviously something conducting the light of Sef Ulama Tzilis into Ulama Bria. And why wouldn't that be called the bris between that and that? And why wouldn't that make them into one 
set. I don't have a good answer, at least in the, for this. We could just say this is how it is, and there's differences, or we can explain the difference in the end. In other words, if you would understand the idea, we might, yes, be able to understand the difference. I think um, later in Shara Tzilis, Briya Tzilas, Sira, and so on, there's a real difference in a Briya and Elma Tzilis, and we mean something when we make this into a set of 10 and that into another set. But the way he's saying it here, which is trying to like sort of giving you the proofs for it, uh, I don't know how they're supposed to work, or at least if someone understands, they can tell me. But I understand what he's saying, but I don't understand why it's, why it's necessary, why it's logically necessary, right? Because it's very easy, it seems to be very easy to say that there is something between the hands and feet. And actually, even the Farshma of Safi Tzira that understood it this way and did understand that there is something between, because the same body, the same torso is actually connecting your hands and your feet. There, there's something, right? They didn't, they didn't come from nowhere. The feet are connected to the hands via the body and so on. Um, uh, and the same way, there's, there's and basically in the same way, it doesn't seem to be, at least let's look at the body. Uh, what the Safi Tzira says is another question, but it's obvious if you look at the body, there doesn't seem to be a real reason to say, I mean, of course, there's a reason, again, if you go back to my answer, if you look at the image, that there's a reason. We could say hands symbolize or show action, feet show not exactly action, maybe something else, maybe feet show walking or going or movement, but they don't show action in the way the hands, whenever you say, right, we don't, we don't say someone has good feet if he's a good, uh, if he's a good creator of things. We say good feet, maybe if he's a good, uh, if he's a runner or a, maybe a soldier even, right, different things. And there's actually, these are images, these are actually biblical images and Kabbalistic images. They, feet are associated with war and things like that. And it makes sense. Even in the most basic sense, it makes sense, right? We, if I tell someone that he has good hands, I might mean he's a good artist, I might mean he's a good uh, artisan, he creates nice chairs, he's a carpenter, anything like that, he's a creator. If I say someone has good feet, I either, either he's like a sports, right? He's a runner, or sports are, were not really <laughs> relevant in, in ancient times so much, or there were sports, but and I mostly mean that he's a warrior. Right, so feet are very much associated with with war, with with uh, conquest, with uh, with uh, strength in in war. Right, if you could run fast, you could conquer people. You could run away. You could do good sports well, and things like that. So, if some say someone has good feet. I mean, something very different than saying that he has good hands. And there's of course a very qualitative difference between these two things. They have different meanings, and of course it might make some sort of sense to associate hands with one world. I don't actually understand in general how. And in the end of the day, it's not really going to work. What he says that. Ulama Matzilis is the hands and Ulama Briya is the feet because that's not, he definitely agrees that there's in Ulama Matzilis itself uh, a hands and feet. So that, and even in this shot, we'll see later. So if there's a Tzalem and him and, and the Sviris have an image of a person, then of course they have feet too. So it's not really, I don't think it's really what he means. So therefore, I'm not a little stuck about that, about that part. So, so again, I'm going to repeat myself a fifth time. So the logic of there being Ulama Matzilis and Ulama Briya makes sense. The logic of the hands connecting with each other and not with if it makes sense. The kind of simple way in which he says it, it seems to not be enough. There seems to be missing some ingredients for the for the for the chesed, for the logic to actually be necessary to actually to actually prove anything. Which is language he uses He tried to make it to prove something. Okay, so now, but but maybe if we take off the, the if we sort of uh, lower expectations of what kind of proof and or if we or if we assume that this is really based on ideas which make sense and not really improving from the hands and feet which seem to be a little weak, then we could start making sense of, of this. Okay, so Atkan is his understanding of the Mishnah, his first level of understanding of the Mishnah, which is that this Mishnah, this is all proving that there are ten spheres and also giving us a little bit of the essence of those ten spheres as we discussed Belima and Mispa, they have Number, they have, they participate. They have some kind of number, number in some sense, but in another sense not. And they are sourced in the idea of the ten fingers, which have a connection between the hands and not between the feet. And the proof for that is that there is a bris between the hands and between the feet, but not between the hands and feet. Okay. And hands and feet, what do they show? They show us this idea of the ulama bria being a shadow of the ulama tils or an image of it. Okay. Now, so that's that's we finish this part for the most part. Now. We have to understand what is this Tzafi Yitzira actually saying. So this is very interesting. So now he's going on and taking it literally. In other words, not just reading this as a proof for the ten spheres existing, and then you would say, okay, and what is the first five? What is the second five? Maybe we don't have to answer that. But Kong Tim, of course, we do have to answer that. So we have to know what does it mean? Which five spheres are the five, and which five are the Chumash, right? Chumash, Kneged Chumash. In the Tzafi Yitzira, if you read Tzafi Yitzira itself, it's at least not clear that this is the case, right? Because actually, the Sefi goes on to elaborate a lot of his associations in great detail. It's mostly when we get to the 
to the letters in the later chapters of Sefi Yitzira. It tells you Aleph is this and Bez is that and so on. He doesn't really ever do a lot of associations with the ten spheres of his first of his first chapter. There is a list of ten the ten spheres in the in the end of the first chapter, Achas Rechlim Chaim and so on. And all of these structures, for example, Chomesh Kneged Chomesh is not something that we find elaborated in the Sefi Yitzira. So May, this is really the only place where we have this five and five separation, this five and five structure of, of ten spheres. And it's not clear what exactly it means, right? You know, Pipshat of Sefi Tzira, what could it mean? Chomesh Keneged Chomesh, right? Maybe just showing, like, the Pipshat would say, just showing ten spheres are like ten hands and so on. But is it clear that we need to find the actual correspondence to, like, the right hand is these spheres and the left hand is these spheres? And even more than that, we actually have names for the spheres in the language of Sefi Yitzira, which are not the names that the Mechabalim used, that we discussed already earlier. Sefi Yitzira at least has a list of spheres, and the ten spheres, as far as anyone can tell, are the six cardinal directions, so up, left, and four, which are Ruach, Maim, Ruach, and Ruach, and Maim, and Ish. So two Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh, and Plein Ruach, and water and fire, so wind, water, fire, and the ten... The Ten directions, the six directions. This is the Sefi Yitzira's list of ten spheres. So these are his names. Of course, the Mekabalim are going to associate this with what they call ten spheres, which are Kese, Chachma, Bina, Chesed, Gvert, Peres, Netzach, Hoid, Yisod, Malchus. But that's not language of Sefi Yitzira. That's language of other, maybe Sefer I'm not sure what's the first source of this, these words. But this is definitely not the Sefi Yitzira's language. So even just associating this with that is already uh, importing one system on another system, or at least interpreting one thing in light of the other, which complicates things, right? Because he asked me, Pshat Sefi Yitzira, what's Chomesh Kneged Chomesh? Obviously, he's saying that the five hands have some, are five and five with something in the middle. That's definitely what he is saying. More than that, we can maybe call speculation or we can call importing other structures on top of the structure of the Sefi Yitzira, of the basic uh, scaffold, of the basic uh, skeleton of the Sefi Yitzira structure. But anyways, assuming that this is, this is Kabbalah, assuming that we do that we do have these ten spheres that we know of, ten, that using and using our names, right? Which is not consistent with the Sefei Tzira's names, but using our names, we start having discussions. What does Chomesh Kneged Chomesh might mean, or what it might symbolize in the spheres? Besides for it being sort of the proof for spheres because of the idea of the hands and so on, what are the five and five? Now, there doesn't seem to be a simple way. This is this is complicated. It doesn't seem to be a simple way. That's important because you can see this is important even for Kavukol Asari, for Omer Kavulam. This is a very important thing, and there's a reason the Ramak is has very long arichas about this. It's actually foundational in, in a certain sense. There doesn't seem to be a simple way. There doesn't be a, a straightforward way to this divide spheres in five and five. Okay, so the names again we know. I mean, he didn't even tell us yet. This is again going backwards. And in, in the end of the Shari, does do it. But we know the names of the ten spheres, which are Kese, Chachma, Bina, Chesed, which the Ramak generally calls Gedula, Gvura, Teferes. Netzach, Hoid, Yesod, Malchus. So these are ten. Ela Esas Firas. Okay. These are the ten spheres, the known as ten spheres. There's discussions on each of, on some of them, but this is the word, the the general way that I always use it, and this is how we generally use. Now, of course, I counted ten, so this five and five. So Kesa Chachm bin Nachasad Gvira are one, then Tferas, Netzach, Hoid, Yesod, Malchus are next two. Okay, we can divide it into five. Like any time you have ten, you can divide it into five. But there doesn't seem to be an, any obvious reason to do that. Or any simple reason to do that. There are certain ways in which in spheres generally get divided, and at least if we read Zohar and texts like this, of course, this is all assuming a certain meaning of the spheres. So I, what I'm thinking, and I didn't uh, figure it out yet, but I think that one of the big things that we really need to do here and to understand the meaning of this is to figure out how different people understand what spheres are, what are they for, where they do, where they go. So on, of course, the different separations, different orders between the dividing spheres in different ways, or categorizing them in different ways, is definitely going to be based on the understanding of spheres. And probably, of course, you might say that it's independent, these are independent variables, but probably the people saying one Chomesh connected Chomesh have a certain understanding of spheres. And that's where they say it. People saying another way, I have a certain understanding of spheres, and that's why they say it, and so on. So that's probably what's really going on here. Ramak, like most good books, doesn't really... Uh, acknowledge that there's entirely different ways of reading things and therefore you should interpret different sources or different books in the, in the ways that they and the self understood it. What he does is he always assumes his understanding, he always assumes his meaning and his system, which is based on the Zohar and based on how he understood the Zohar, and then asks, makes everything work according to that, right? If, if you find someone that says something that doesn't work with that, you would say, well, 
you're wrong because in my system it's it's not true. Of course, in that person's system it totally might be true, but just that for him it doesn't work. Okay, so now slow somewhat we start seeing this right here. Okay, and now the remark in general I'm going to give you the overview because this is going to get us very or it's going to fly around in a thousand different directions, so we have to be very clear. The remark in general is giving us three different understandings of Chamesh, Keneged, Chamesh. In three, two, really two total different ways of reading it. And then in the first one, there's two ways. and the second way, there's one way. What do I mean? So number one, the first, the way I'm the most far from understood this, again, assuming that the Safi Yitzira is doing something to divide the Sphiris, which I'm not convinced of in Pshat, but assuming that, there's really two ways to do it. We can divide it up top bottom or left right. Of course, the left right both of these organizations of Sphiris are not in Safi Yitzira. The way they do or come from is a very serious question, and what they mean is a serious question. Right, the Safi Yitzira just has a list. Maybe they just a list one, two, three, and four, five, six, and there's no structure between them. Or actually, if we read the Safi Yitzira itself and we see it associating Sphiris with direction, so maybe there's like a cube which has six sides and then four things besides for that cube. So then we have a natural, a natural uh, separation of four and six, right? And this separation of four and six is pretty close to a very famous separation in Kabbalah between 3 and 7, and which it might literally be the same or might be slightly different, according to how depends on how you connect these two systems, but that's maybe the only uh, structure, the only shape of spirits that we might find in Sefi Yitzira. But most basically, taking this list of 10 spirits, we can divide them top to bottom, right? That would be the most simple way. The most simple way, the most needing the least assumptions would be to say, okay, so five and five, Kese Chachme Bina, Chesed Gvur are one, Tveres Netzach Hoytisad Malchus is two. Why would be the separation, what the separation would mean? That's going to be a serious question. But of course, before that, we can just say, okay, if there's ten fingers, then probably, let's say the right hand starts with Kese and the left hand starts with the Tveres. That would be a, something that makes a lot of sense just from the basic, from, from what we know now of the Tveres. And there definitely were actually a lot of Mechabalim or the David brings both ways, but there's different methods from Sefi that assume this is the Pshat of Sefi Yitzira. So that's the first Pshat. So it's number one, assuming that we are separating the Sefiris. Number two, assuming that Chamesh Kineged Chamesh means this, means that there is five uh, Sefiris on one side and five Sefiris on the left side, which we'll see the Ramak takes issue with later. And then, assuming the most simple understanding of five and five. And then they're going to give a meaning to the two, and then we'll see about that. Number two, what else we can do? which other people said, we can divide spheres not top and bottom, but left and right, or right and left. Now, of course, this idea of the right and left is not in Sefi Yitzira, at least not in an obvious way, right? Again, this, there's right and left hands, right? So if we might say, okay, so look what I just said, the right hand is the Kesse, the first five spheres, and the left hand is the second five spheres. That seems to be what it says, or without any additional information. But some Kabbalim had additional information, and they said that the ten spheres actually are, and we'll see, Shah said Ramidosam, what the source and what's the meaning of this. There's a whole shot in the Ramak about the order or the structure or the shape of the spirit. But the Mechabulim, many Mechabulim, and we have to think of how early and you know, what exactly the meaning of this is and relative to the earlier Pshat. But the, they came with another idea and they said that the spirits are actually structured in, well, let's say, let's say it like this, in three rows. Because that's. Um, Seems to be what this is based on, although it's not explicit. It's not entirely explicit here. Actually, let's let's skip that. Let's let's not say it that way. Although it's probably what it means. But let's let's say it's simpler. Let's say it's simpler here. We'll say that there is right and left. What's right and left? Right and left is a already medrash, uh, medrash image for chesed and din. So now everyone that learned about God's attributes, about God's hanhaga, uh, about God's way of running the world even before Kabbalah, knows that there is right and left. And there's already a Gemara, the Gemara talks about a person that talks about right and left, and says right means naiminem, in other words, noite klape chesed, more compassionate or more uh, kindness, and left is judgment or din or punishment, the opposite of that. Now, of course, we can differentiate a lot of different things about this, and this is a very very serious discussion, but in any case, yamin and smul are very ancient symbols, very, uh, in fact, it's already in the Medrash, before the Mechavu, we know this, for chesed and din. So kindness and judgment, and again, we're not getting into details about this. Okay, so there now, therefore, Sami Kapulim came and decided that there are five spheres that are chesed and five spheres that are din. Of course, 
interestingly, chesed that are themselves two spheres, right? This is why this is very, somewhat complicated. Or, or chesed, known as gedula, and gvura, known as din, are themselves five spheres. So now this is, again, since we're learning this in, in, its, in its source, we have to start to get out of things that we're very used to. This is not as simple. Because chesed and din are concepts prior to spheres. And even according to Mechavillim, they're separate. These concepts, as the concepts, of course, everyone has these very elaborate theories, even Arizal and so on, very elaborate theories of this. So that's why we have, we're doing it very simply and trying to go back. There's concepts known as chesed and din, and these concepts are prior to the concept of spheres. They're different concepts of the concept of spheres. They're not the same. The spheres might have the attributes of being chesed and din. They might belong to the categories of chesed and din. Chesed and din might be one of the things that come out of spheres, might be one of the effects of spheres, and so on, but they're not the same thing. Okay? So if God has and different ways of acting, different ways of, uh, let's say, acting, of uh, managing the world, they're generally described as chesed and din. Of course, like we said, chesed and din, we can talk about compassion and kindness and love and and uh, acceptance. All these things are different. They're not the same exact thing, they're, but they're all sort of chesed. And then we can talk about judgment and harshness and uh, constrictiveness and uh, punishment and things like that, which are all kinds of din. Of course, can be differentiated. Now, starts a new question. Since these spheres are associated with God's creation and, and with the way that God runs this world, and of course these things we will discuss at length, what exactly the relationship of these things are, the entire shidim about this. Now becomes a question, how exactly does that connect? So which spheres are chesed and which spheres are din? And this is actually something that was pretty controversial for a long time and maybe until today. Between the Mechabalim, this is not accepted, although everyone thinks this thinks they know that there's spheres called chesed and din, or chesed and gvur, or gdul and gvur, and so on. It's not actually, of course, pretty obviously those spheres probably are chesed and din, as, as they're named for that. But in the rest of spheres, each one of them has to be associated with one of these sides, since those are the basic two ways of, of having things. And there was big controversies for a long time, and we'll see in the remark later, which spheres are what. Now, in any case, said second Mechabola, I'm reading it here, Right, and we'll, I'm going to skip around just so you see this, and we'll go back to this. Said the second pshat, which is quoted also in the Sefi Yitzira, they said that there are five spheres which are chesed and five spheres which are din. And chesed and din can also be called right and left, just so you know. Chesed and din can also be called right and left, and this has a meaning according to the three, three, three column understanding of spheres. But I'm going to skip it for now because it doesn't seem to be. Uh, what the literal thing, what they're saying here, it might be connected to what and later when we'll have that image in our head, we'll understand it. But over here, we're still talking in concepts. So then they said that there are five. Now, it's in the Sefer Sira said five and five. So we're going to decide five spheres are chesed and five are din. Now, again, even in this, they sort of made it complicated and probably having in mind a different structure, but it doesn't say here. And they said, out of these ten spheres, there are five that are then and five that are not. No, but the reason why I'm saying left and right is because they didn't simply divide it in the order. So everyone sort of agrees, not entirely, but we'll get to this. Everyone sort of agrees that these spheres, the order of them has a meaning. So we, we could call it top to bottom. Keser on top, Chachma afterwards, Bina and so on. So at least that's the order that we always describe the spheres and so it must have some truth and that's the basic, the most basic form that they have. But this second Peshat that talked about dividing the spheres into Keser and Din, didn't divide them just in the, in the simple way which saying Keser until the Gevura is, is Chesed, let's say, and the second one is Din, or the opposite, we could think. And we, there might actually be some truth in that, in that understanding. This, I'm saying this because it's not, only, not even entirely false. But of course, we have to define our terms better to even have anything start to make more sense. But there might be sense. But they said differently. They said, we're not going to divide it top to bottom. We're going to divide it left and right. And what we're going to do is seems, seems to be arbitrarily. In other words, they're doing, they're doing again. And the reality is that there is meanings, reasons for all of this. And the Mac himself is going to quote reasons, but he's not going to... It's not, not far enough into the book to even to, for these reasons to make sense to us or for us to even debate them. But they said there are five right spheres and five left spheres. Now, what are the five right spheres? The five right spheres are Kese, Chachma, Chesed, or Gedula, Netzach, and Tiferes. These are the five right spheres. And the five left spheres are Bina, Gevira, Hodesoid, Malchus. So now, this doesn't seem to be entirely coherent. It doesn't seem to be an obvious reason to do this. There isn't an obvious reason to do this. There is complicated reasons to do this, and he's going to go through it. But that's the second shot. So again, First, we're assuming that we divide the spheres in two. There's two ways of dividing it. One way is dividing top and bottom. So, very simply, from, from Keser until Gvira will be one, from Tiferes to Malchus would be two. Or to divide it left and right, and somewhat arbitrarily assign spheres to left and right. This is not really arbitrary, but this is what it seems to us right now. 
to the say that Kese Chachma Gedula Netzav Tepedet is on the right. So that's the right hand. So not in the order, in the new order. We, we call left and right. Kese Chachma Gedula Netzach Tepedet. Really, probably should be Net Tepedet Netzach. I'm not sure why it says Netzach Tepedet here. And left would be Bina Gvura Hoid Yisoid Malchas. Okay? That's the second shot. The Ramak himself has a third shot, which is a really complicated shot. And Make, leads us into an, two chapters of trying to prove his path and make sense of it, and also entirely a whole bunch of new ideas which we'll have to slowly uh, go through. And his pshat is that he doesn't agree with the entire assumption of both these pshat, and that both of them seem to assume that we should where we are to divide the spheres in two here. Chomesh can chomesh five spheres and five spheres. And he claims that there's not it's not clear from the Mishnah that that's what it's talking about. That five are themselves the five fingers which are being divided. He has a new pshat. And he claims that Chomesh Kenegit Chomesh is really connects with the Bris Yochet Mechven Ezvemt. In other words, we know this concept. And of course, this concept itself um, is, a, is a concept. I'm just saying it like this so we know that we create boxes in our mind that later will be filled in. Right? That's sort of what I'm doing. And there's a concept called Machrian, which is the concept of what we call cooperation, creating cooperation or coordination or mediation between the left and the right, basically. And the Ramak claims that Chomesh Kineget Chomesh means that there's five of them, okay, which are in some way ten. So each one separates, uh, connects the right and the left. So that's five against five. In other words, there's five different areas or five different ways of mediation, five different machrim. And he's going to go through of them what these five machrim are and why they should be interesting. This is a very interesting pshat. And it also needs us to make a whole bunch of assumptions. In other words, we need to prove a whole bunch of different foundations in order for this chat to make sense. But that's the third chat in Ramak, and that's going to take us until the end of Perek Dalet to prove the um, the third chat, mostly. Okay. So now we have these two ways, which is divided into three ways. Two ways are either this Chomesh Kineget Chomesh is dividing the Tvirat in two, or according to Ramak, Chomesh Kineget Chomesh is not dividing the Tvirat at all. It's talking about five different kind of middles, basically. Right? The, the, the thing that's not the ten spheres, that's the one that's getting divided into become five. There's five of them, and going through those. And according to the first understanding, which is a simple understanding, which is that we should divide it two, there's a one way of dividing it top and bottom, and the second way, which is dividing it left and right, and sort somewhat assigning different spheres to left and right according to all kinds of detailed uh, reasons. Okay, that's that's uh, we can we could call this the end of part two of this class. Okay. Now we take a breath and we'll try to go, try to read at least his first chat, which gets us to the end of the first pedic. Okay. So and we'll make, make a scene on the first chapter of Padis Ramayim. So we're up to here, right? So we just said they divided the spheres into two parts. Now we're going to see what Ramak says about this. So let's say what Ramak quotes. I didn't find someone saying that exactly this quote, so we'll have to still find it. But I know that people say this many times. Different Mikulim say this. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll look it up exactly. The Rabbin Zavitzir and others, they seem to have this understanding. And they say something like this. The first five spheres, which are Kese, Chachma, Bina, Chesed, Gvura, are upper spheres. They're the heavenly spheres. And the way they say it, Ramak quotes, Lenahel Hal in other words, since the spheres, and this is again complicated, but because we have to understand these two things, spheres have their existence for themselves. They're not only, or at least the coins of the Ramak, we'll see later in Shamus, they're not only to describe Hanhaga. They're not only for uh, leading or controlling the world. They have existence for their own reasons, for knowledge, we'll get to that. But it's at least one of the things they do. It's at least one of the things that's important. Ways, one of the easy ways of differentiating between spheres will say, What's this sphere? Oh, this sphere does this, this sphere does that. Although that not, might not be entirely what it is, but it's at least what it does, or at least what kind of influence, what kind of effect it has on the world. Right? So now these people, they said that there's two kinds of worlds. And of course, that itself is an assumption which needs to be, again, like I'm saying, they really this starts to lead us to entire understandings of the world which these things are based on. But they had an understanding that there's something called Aliyoinim and something called Achtoinim. So Achtoinim probably or is this world, the world that we could see, or the visible world, right? The sensible world, as it's called in in the earlier earlier sources. And there's Aliyoinim, which is the what they call the intellectual world, the intelligible world, right? The world of maybe Malochim, maybe spheres themselves, things that are not uh, seeing, seeable, not visible, not sensible in this world, but are the upper world, what's known as the upper world. So maybe angels, maybe different things like that. 
uh, maybe spheres themselves, but spheres are probably even beyond that. So, and then they said that therefore we have these two parts of spheres, two levels of spheres. So the higher level corresponds, it manages, it leads, it controls the higher world. So the these are the spheres that have control, that have effects in the higher world, corresponding to their higher place in the in the hierarchy of spheres. And then the lower spheres, which are that's the one that has authority or control over the lower world, which corresponds to their level in the hierarchy of spheres. Okay? So that's what the earlier understanding was. And the Ramak says, I half ways agree and half ways disagree. So when we have to understand there's a lot of different levels with which we could agree or disagree with on Pshutim in something like a text like Sefi Yetzir, right? We could agree or disagree on what the Sef text means, what seems to be the simplest or the clearest understanding of the text. We'll see later that Amak really thinks that his Pshat is the best understanding of the text, so he disagrees with this whole, all this Pshatim, but okay, that's the number one. Number two, we could agree or disagree with the concepts being expressed, right? We could say, uh, just like they said, uh, these are for the for affecting or for controlling the upper worlds. These are for controlling the lower worlds. We could agree that there's such a thing, an upper world and a lower world. We could agree that there's different spheres that correspond to the leadership or to the control of those worlds. We could agree with, or we could disagree with that. And there's a third thing which is separate from this. It's very interesting that Ramak separates it. And like we said, because this is because he doesn't see Hanhaga. He doesn't see Hanhaga. I don't know a good translation for the word Hanhaga. I keep on saying control or leadership or or effect, but that's all, all these things, it means all these things. And he doesn't think that that, what's known as Hanaga, is the essence of the spheres. He thinks that spheres are not only for controlling the world, they're not only for managing the world, they're for themselves in a different, in a real, in another sense. So he does agree. So this is where he gets a third thing. He says, I, I disagree. And this is where he says, I disagree with the idea that some spheres are for the upper world and some spheres are for the lower world. Okay, and now, and he doesn't say here why he disagrees with it. I found another place where he talks about it. And we'll have to get to Shamus Fanuga to see exactly how he understands. But the basic understanding is that he thinks that all spheres are for everything. Or at least the seven lower spheres. Maybe only some spheres. In other words, he has a different understanding of how the spheres relate to the world. Not this understanding that these people had that is five upper and five lower. He had a different understanding. And in general, he understands that all spheres are for everything in a very important sense. And it's not really nice, not really correct to dif- make these differences and say the five hopper are for this, five lower are for that. He disagrees with that. All spheres, or at least most spheres, or, or at least uh, however we'll get to it, are are leading or having Hanaga on, on the entire world. Of course, through an entire structure of how that works, but he doesn't agree with this kind of differentiation. Doesn't basically doesn't understand Kabbalah in the way that the people that said this chat understood it. And... Therefore, he disagrees with that, but he does agree with a third thing. And this is interesting. He agrees that there is some sort of difference, some sort of structure. It's correct to divide the spheres in this way. That's as much as he agrees. And why does he agree with that? Because he found the Zohar dividing the spheres in this way. And I'm not, I looked up, tried to look up some of these Zohars. I'm not entirely um, sure that it says exactly what he says it says. But at least he says. Sometimes, and this is interesting, sometimes someone notices something, I'll say this because it's relevant to a lot of other things, sometimes someone notices something, someone notices a structure or a, a sort of organization or categorization, and he gives that, on that he imposes a meaning, he imposes an understanding. And very often, this happens often, I'm not going to give examples right now, very often the person that identified a correct structure, but his meaning is wrong, and this is because the basic structures of things, how to organize things, how things are organized, is in a certain sense more basic than the meaning. And we often impose a meaning. Right? For example, let me, let me give a simple example. If someone reads a Masechta, right, and he finds, well, this Masechta is divided into two parts. It talks about this and talks about that. And then he gives you a Pshat. He says, well, this, this is what the first part is about. This is what the second part is about. Very often, his, his difference, his, his, his structure is true, but his Pshat is wrong, or is not as true as the Pshat, as the structure. Because the pshat is just what he understands it to be about. But the fact that is, this text is divided into this amount of chapters, into this amount of structure, that is more true. Same thing is true actually for, for nature, and the same thing is true for, for a lot of for philosophy, for a lot of things. Very often, since, at least in the way the Makabulim understand the world, structure is prior to meaning. So the structures are there. They're, they're, they were actually exist. And it's, it's many different meanings open us to see different structures or show us, make it clear certain lines that divide things in different ways and organize things in different ways. 
But those things are more, uh, sometimes more true or easier to notice than the meaning. And the meaning is generally based on our assumptions, based on our prior assumptions that we have and our ways of understanding the world, which we're going to impose on those structures. But like he says here, these in the Kabbalim, they identified a correct structure. But he disagrees with their meaning. Their meaning was that this is for the Leoidim and this is for the Chetonim. He disagrees with that. He thinks that that's wrong. That's based on an entirely wrong understanding of Sphiris and their relationship to the world. So it's not just wrong locally. It's wrong. The ent- entire idea is wrong. But this doesn't mean that their structure isn't correct. Now, what is the meaning of that structure according to the Ramak that we have to understand also? That's another interesting, important thing, right? Uh, in any case, well, he doesn't do that now, so I'm not going to be able to do this for the, right now. But let's uh, just wrap up to Gu's proof text. And why? Because for the Ramak, the most the thing that's the most important, that's the most machria, the most authoritative thing is text of the Zohar. Anything that's in the Zohar is true. Anything that's not in the Zohar might be true, but doesn't necessarily true. And he takes the Zohar as primary, right? Even the Sefer Tzira, he puts it into the Zohar, not the other way around, and so on. And he says, yes. And of course, in the Zohar itself, we find a whole lot of different structures for Sphiris. Of course, the Zohar is not a monolithic text. There's a lot of different ways. Some people will tell you, well, these are different authors. Maybe what he quotes here is mostly from Raya Mehemna, from the Zohar, which might have a different way of understanding Sphiris as the Zohar itself. He doesn't usually, he sometimes does, but usually assumes that there's one system at least, although it might have a lot of different implementations, might have a lot of different understanding, might have a lot of different details, but he's usually going to try to see it as one system and then understand what this is talking about, what that's talking about. So he says, in some places, we do find this organization of spheres in the czar sometimes. Not always, very often. He says different ways. But we have find this time. And for ex- and he quotes, he gives three sources. Uh, two, actually. Two or three sources, two and a half sources in the czar for this way of thinking. And therefore, it's true. Now, what it means, he doesn't say. And we'll probably, if we'll look up the czar in those places, we might find out. Maybe I'll do that because I think that's important. Uh, to do that. But right now, I'm just going to read what he says. He says, we find that the Rashbi is saying about Tefillin. And the Rashbi talks about Tefillin. This is the structure that he has. Interesting structure. And the same structure. He's gonna, both sources that he quotes have the same structure. It's not exactly the five and five structure. It's really a one and four and four and one structure. Because the Zohar says that there's four parshas in Tefillin, right? Four parshas in Tefillin Sharosh, four parshas in Tefillin Shaliyat. So there's eight, right? Now, of course, they're the same parsha. The only difference is in the Tefillin Sharosh, they're in four different uh, batim, and the Tefillin Shaliyat, they're in one what? One holder, one bias. Okay. But the Zohar has an explanation of this, and it says, and it's not explicit over there. We have to, you have to read Zohar. I looked it up, and I couldn't figure it out because the Zohar is using his code, and I have to look up the Ramak to see how he read it. But the Zohar basically says that there's four parshas, and those are correspond to the four upper spheres, Chachma, Bina, Gedula, and Gvira. So that's the four parshas, Shema, Vahem, Shema, Kadosh, Vahek, in some way, are Chachma, Bina, Gedula, and So these are the four higher spheres. And then the Tefillin Shaliyad, which the Zohar always understands as a lower level, right? There's the heart, the head, and the, and the hand, or the heart, which is definitely a lower level in some sense. He corresponds those four parashis to the four lower spheres, which are Tefillin, Netzach, Chay, Desoy. Then he quotes the Zohar in verse Hanan, which says this. And he says, although we need to understand this, and not only we need to understand this, this is one of the primary ways of the Ramak understanding things, we need to make this, uh, synchronize this with another idea of the Zohar, which says very often that four parashis of Tefillin are the four oysters of the Shem, right? Yud Kev of K, or Aleph Dalad Nun Yud, the four Shem, right? Sometimes they say Yud Kev of K in, in the Tefillin Shadosh, Adnan Aleph Dalad Nun Yud in the Tefillin Shaliyad. So that seems to be different, right? Because the Tefillin Shadosh are not uh, generally, the reason what he means to say is generally the Yud Kev of K is known as Chachma bin Tefillin and Malchus, not as Chachma bin Chesed and Gvura, right? So the Vuv and the Hay are not Chesed and Gvura generally, so that doesn't seem to match with what he says here. So we need a lot of understanding. In any case, that's not his subject right now. But we do see that the Zohar is separating the spheres. In other words, we do see a separation happening by the Tefillin, right? We don't yet see the five and five. We really see four and four. We'll see in a second what happens with the five and five. But what we see is that there's some difference. There's some. There's a bigger difference between Gvura and Tefillin than there's between Chesed and Gvura, right? That's another way of saying it, right? If we are to divide something in half, there's there's a half. The cut happens after the Gvura and before the Tefillin. So the Tefillin somewhat belongs to a lower level, and Chesed Gvura is still up belong to the higher level. So that's what we learn here, right? And he shows you another place. And if you look in this place, you'll understand how this really does correspond somewhat to the five and five, because it's four and four. And of course, we might understand that there's obviously Kesa before Chachman, there's also Malchus after Yisod. So that's really the fifth that connect, uh, finishes us to ten, that completes us to ten. Um, but the quotes of Noah's Zohar and Tikkunim, they, these people like wrote in the two different places in the Tikkunim, the Tikkun Zohar has very often talks about the Merkava. Now the Merkava very famously again is four. So there's very famously in the Cheskel, 
uh, Merkava, which has four sides, right? Four faces, really, four sides, which are known, those four sides are known as Pnei Adam, human face, Pnei Nesher, right, an eagle face, Pnei Arye, a lion, and Pnei Shor, and a, a uh, how do you say, a shor? Okay, so these are the, um, the right, the bull. So these are the four faces of the Merkava. So again, this four. Now again, we sort of have to add connect this into the ten spheres. So this may be another question, really, for the Zohar. How the four sides, the Ichaskel Sokars, where do they fit into the ten spheres system? And the Zohar says very often something like this, a few times, the Tkuni Zohar, again, this is not the Zohar, and the previous piece that he quoted is also actually in the Raim Hemna, which is uh, connected to the Tkuni Zohar. But the Tkuni Zohar says like this, that these four are like the are there's so he says something like this says there's four twice Merkava and actually in Yechaskel is twice so maybe that's what he's interpreting but I'm not sure right now but he said there's two Merkava so again we have two levels one above the other and they and he identifies these term four and four with these eight spheres with these same eight spheres he says Pnei Adam the first one is Chachma and he says why because Chachma can be divided into Koyach Ma Ma is the gematria of Adam so Chachma is Adam okay remember that's not we're not getting into the details for right now. Then Nesher is Bina, Arya is Chesed, Shoir is Gvura. Okay? So these are the four, first four again. So we have basically the same four. Chachma, Bina, Chesed, Gvura. Or, okay? Or Gedula, which is known as Chesed sometimes. Same thing. Now, and then he says that the second one, which is Merkava Shnia, which is again, Odam at the Feres. So Odam, according to the Kurim, Odam has two meanings. Chachma and the Feres. Just remember this. In a lot of contexts we find it. Mashma Vashem. But only Chachma and the Feres is known as Odam. According to Kinezar. Anyway, Adam Teferes, Netzach Hoid again, Netzach Arya Shoid would be Hoid, and Nesher would be Yisoid, okay? Or maybe, the, I'm not sure exactly for the details here, because he doesn't give them. So that's the second one. In any case, and then the Tikkun is ah. Oh. So what happened with the five? So he says, Keser Elion is on top, includes everything from the top. And Malchus is on the bottom, includes everything on the bottom. So I'm not sure what Hakol would only mean the top half, because that's what we need really for this to, be, to make sense in, this, in our uh, thing that we have here. But it doesn't entirely say that. So there is a difference. So let's just to be clear, there is a difference between the Zohar structure that he says here and the structure of these Mefarshim. These Mefarshim had a very simple five and five structure. The Zohar has a four and four structure. And of course, there's on top Malchus, uh, on top Keser and the bottom Malchus. So these are sort of uh, general principles which are above everything or below everything. But it's not the exact same exact because the Merkava or the Tefillin is four and four, not five and five. But in any case, the Ramak says, I do see that these people at least divided in the correct place, right? So in other words, the top-bottom thing is true. There's not only the left-right thing like we see later and so on. The top-bottom differentiation, the top-bottom categorization of Swedish is true because the Zohar has this also, although in a totally different way, and although that needs to be understood as part of a different system and there's reasons. So in any case, then he says there's even more proofs if you really want to look, you'll find other places. The point is, he agrees with this, uh, with this uh, chat. Well, I'm not going to be able to finish today. Uh, here, you see. Doesn't look like I'm able to finish because he still has to now read the whole Mishnah in order to make sense with this, and we're going to have to bring a whole bunch of other ideas in to, to make this sense. And I'm really going too fast, so let's let's wrap up over here, and we'll so we at least know the idea of these this chat and their Mac, where he agrees and where he disagrees, right? So again, there's three different ways we can agree or disagree with. We can agree about the meaning of the text. Their Mac doesn't entirely agree with the meaning of the text, like we say he has a third chat, which is his chat of the text. We can agree with the meaning with the with the actual idea that the person said, and he doesn't agree with their idea because he doesn't agree that the Elyonim and Tachtoyim have different parts and spheres, at least not in this way. But he does agree with the basic structure that they identified, although, like we see, not in the exact same way because they identified a structure which is five and five, five, five above, five below. According to him, which he quotes from the Zohar, at least that's what it seems to be saying. Maybe he means to say that there's really five and five of the Zohar is referring to that, so I'm not sure, but at least the two Zohars that he quotes, which is for him what decides everything, is that the Zohar has a 4 4 1 1 structure, which at least separates the spheres by top and bottom in the same, in the same way. Okay, so that's, that's enough for today. Just to, another note to finish with is that the Arizal generally doesn't work with this structure of 5 and 5, definitely not with the way the Mefarshim did, but he does sometimes. So it's important to notice that Arizal in his, and the Mefarshim already associated these two things. I'm not the first one to notice this connection. And like, so one of the things people always want to know is how Darizal matches with Ramak and so on. There's actually a lot of things in Darizal which are literally taken from Ramak and even taken from parts of the earlier systems or different systems that Ramak so much rejected. Like we see here, it doesn't really take seriously most of the time this 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 structure of five and five. Darizal does actually take it in very many many places seriously in a certain sense. 
And he talks very often about Parsufim having a very big difference in the Teferes. Because sometimes that is put Teferes on top, sometimes on the bottom, but that's he makes things more complex. But that is very often talks about the higher part of Sphiris and the lower part, for example, in, in different parts of him, which for parts of him is in part and Sphiris. But all these things I'm saying too many things. In any case, that is very, very much in a certain sense has his own understanding of what the higher Sphiris are and the lower Sphiris are. And sometimes he might, or some Mephoshim might quote this mission that they prove his idea of Chomesh, Kineget Chomesh, so the lower Sphiris being Tiferes Netzachoy Desoid, Tiferes Netzachoy Desoid Malchus, and the higher Sphiris being Kesachach Mabinna. Chesed and Fura. These are very different worlds for that. Rizal talks about often, for example, about Chagat and Ahi being different worlds. It's somewhat, uh, it also corresponds to this. So it's actually an idea which is alive for that Rizal and uh, later in Kabbalah.